uh, tackle the topic uh, performance uh, in various ways. Uh, so we will not only talk about technology, we will talk about artistic interventions, critical perspectives, we will talk about the body, uh, etc. And I would like to start uh, with uh, an insight into the making of. So Geoffrey already mentioned the new animation and uh, uh, the trailer by Glenn Marshall, um, yeah, perfectly um, expresses uh, this idea of new forms of uh, animation and also performance. So a glimpse into the trailer. You have the possibility to, to look at uh, making of uh, online, so every uh, lecture will be archived on uh, YouTube uh, expanded animation channel as well. So it's just a glimpse. But how to see he has uh, developed uh, the aesthetics and the animation. Uh, Glenn Marshall uh, got a uh, honorary mention last year and he used this uh, procedure uh, transforming a dance performance based on machine learning uh, into a crow performance actually. And we started a, a, a discussion when we came up with the idea that this year expanded animation is tackling performance. And uh, that was quite interesting when he sent us the first uh, example in the beginning of February, I think so. And uh, then we came up with this critique or with the feedback to say, okay, it looks too perfect. We need a little bit more glitch. Uh, it should look like AI. So. Um, that was our feedback and then it was an evolving process uh, to uh, produce uh, the final trailer. So performance of course has uh, various uh, interpretations, it's about power and also uh, yeah, of course uh, um, um, yeah, um, describing uh, an action. Uh, but staging, uh, artistic staging, uh, uh, the action itself is our focus and there are a lot of uh, um, yeah, building blocks that we will discuss. So this was the the feedback from our side to say more abstract, more glitchy, etc. So I think that's enough from right now. So uh, performance. Um, in the next three days we will talk about uh, uh, performances between uh, robots, between AI. We will also talk about live performance. We already saw a very interesting um, performance or documentation of a performance uh, at Deep Space. For those who have uh, entered uh, or have participated uh, at the opening ceremony or uh, yesterday at the gala, we have already seen a lot of uh, performances with animation. So this is a, a very short uh, um, glimpse into the program. We already kicked off uh, today with a, a research uh, workshop uh, at 10 o'clock and uh, continued at uh, 11 o'clock with uh, the panel Art and Industry. Today we will uh, have two further uh, very interesting approaches. The this one is right now on artistic uh, perspectives and then we will uh, have performative acts. For those who don't know what is uh, actually happening at the end, uh, please stay until the end, there will be a surprise. Uh, next day, uh, we will continue with uh, our CIFA forum, uh, also artistic approaches. We have uh, VR artists here, uh, they are exhibited downstairs as well. So we always try to have this link between uh, artists that are presenting here projects and exhibiting at Deep Space or the, the museum itself. And uh, then it's uh, about the new animation art category, so the pre-forum featuring the prize winners. I will not tell you anything more. So this is the time, 2 p.m. tomorrow, to be there and to listen to the current uh, winners and the first Golden Nico winner in, in the new animation art category. Then we will uh, continue with uh, virtual stages. And uh, the third day, just one sentence or two, is dedicated uh, to synesthesia. This is a, a collaboration with Bikita Hosea, she's with us, uh, and this uh, uh, day, Synesthetic Syntax, is dedicated to um, um, a critical perspective. Uh, we, we send out a call to artists and researchers uh, yeah, to submit uh, proposals in this field of uh, 
yeah, uh, performance, uh, critical performance, ghost versus the machine is the title. And the highlight is the keynote by Ghislaine Boddington. Uh, 6 p.m. will be the closing note. So that's the plan. And this is not everything because uh, between uh, all these panels there is happening a lot of things. And I will pass over uh, to uh, Daniela, the co-curator of the uh, Ars Electronic Animation Festival. And expanded animation is, so to speak, under the umbrella of the Animation Festival. Daniela. Thank you. Yeah, so the Animation Festival is a sort of aftermath of the pre arts Electronica for New Animation Art. It was really a pleasure to select films for this because we had a huge material to choose from. I think there was never that many submissions. 1, exactly, yeah. and from these, we selected 15 that were awarded with a prize or an honorary mention, and then we selected other 20 maybe to show in the festival, and we grouped them around certain categories. So we have the electronic theater, which is um, compiled of the winner, winning projects. Then we have the Austrian panorama, which is with films by local Austrian, uh, ba Austria-based artists, the young animations with submissions from the U19 category, and then some other like da data bodies, space. Um, it's a very um, interesting selection because it kind of delves into very sensorial bodily digital worlds and also nightmarish future scenarios. Then we have the AI and human that tackles the same topics as the festival is tackling this year and um, maybe it's worth saying that uh, you don't have to be afraid of missing any of these <laughs> because they are looping in the seminar room uh, so every day at least two times you can see one screening program and then it also runs in the deep space we have like one hour a day so today we had from 1 to 2 tomorrow also from 1 to 1.30 and 1.30 until 2 uh, also, a, a showcase of, uh, um, of uh, Akiko Nakayama's uh, project and Rebecca Merlitz's game simulation. And also on Sunday, the highlight is the, uh, sh the showcase of the Golden Ika winning project, the Livery Dancer Sphere. Uh, and then in the Post City, in the courtyard, there's also a selection. So you can also see like, around 10 films there. So. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. In the post city is a screen where you see uh, a lot of uh, uh, the prize winning projects, and there is, of course, uh, the exhibition of the prize winners. So there is also the possibility to see some projects, especially VR projects. So um, I have to show you the so-called, I used a phrase from uh, Gerfried, uh, logo tapete. Uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, uh, such a, um, a symposium, such an event is not possible without uh, uh, a big deal of uh, support. Uh, Gerfried already mentioned the team behind, so there are a lot of people. I will not uh, mention everybody, but we are very happy uh, to have uh, collaborations with uh, local partners, but I'm very proud that we also have some research projects uh, um, yeah, collaborating with us, new collaborators like uh, Player On or uh, Acute uh, um, EU projects uh, um, that are collaborating in this field of uh, performance. So uh, it's, it's a big team and this is of course worth to give a big applause, especially uh, to the volunteers from uh, the University of Applied Sciences that are uh, watching uh, online or are here. So a big applause to our team. <laughs> so without any further ado, uh, I will pass over to uh, Nana. Thank you. OK, um, welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure now to um, present the artist position panel. Um, while our speaker can already set up, um, this panel seeks to highlight, of course, artists and their works 
It is a space where artists share an insight into their practice, their perspectives, and their approaches. And we have a wonderful panel ahead of us. Our first speaker is Miva Matrejek. And we had the chance to see a, a snippet of her work now at the Deep Space Screening, which is called Infinitely Yours. This is a work where Miva Matrejek received the Golden Nika in 2020 in the category of computer animation. And it's also uh, a piece which she travels with and performs it in front of a live audience. I would like to add a little bit more about our speaker. She's an animator, designer, and performer, firmly based in Los Angeles, currently based in Vancouver. And she has been an internationally touring independent artist since 2010. She travels as a one-woman show, often incorporating artist talks and workshops. Now, let's everybody welcome Miva Matrejek. Idea, microphone. Um, hi, um, I'm Mia Matrejek. Um, thank you for the introduction. I think I'll be repeating it a little bit when I do my intro here. Um, I am an animator, designer, and performer. Um, I tend to be in an interdisciplinary performance space, but my MFA degree is in exponent animation and integrated media from California Institute of the Arts. So I'm kind of more in the, often in the performing arts theater space, but I come from an animation background. Um, I have a Japanese American background, and I'm primarily from the US. Um, but recently moved to Canada uh, two years ago where I live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Salutooth nations, currently known as Vancouver at Simon Fraser University. Um, I'm thrilled to be here at Arts Electronica and honored to have my work featured along with such incredible artists and esteemed colleagues from around the world in this beautiful city. Um, today I'll discuss my approaches to bring presence, transformation, and embodiment to my unique form of storytelling through my multimedia art, and that combines projected animation and performer and shadow silhouette. Um, I'm just curious from the people here in the audience if um, there are folks who saw the screening downstairs. A few people, yeah. So there was a kind of a longer 15-minute excerpt. Um, today I'll be just speaking over um, what you see. Um, I create live performances that integrate my kaleidoscopic animations with body and space on stage. The performances are centered around the shadow that I cast as I move behind a projection screen. Um, combining projection upon a single screen allows me to create complex visual compositions and illusions as my shadow becomes a seemingly seamlessly integrated part of the moving image between the foreground and background. So this is from um, a performance I did with a live band, a live quartet. Uh, my work attempts to make invisible worlds visible while weaving surreal and poetic narratives of a creation and destruction, micro and macro worlds, and the conflict between humanity and nature. With over 15 years of tinkering, I pushed this interdisciplinary technique of layered projections to create increasingly complex images, even with a straightforward setup. One that in many ways is not that different from the magic lantern shows of over a century ago. I consider my work to integrate both the digital and the handmade, both in the process of making the visuals as well as on stage. Um, first, I want to clarify that I consider the live performance to be my work, not the documentation video or photo, as we have been seeing right now because it's out of context of the live experience and co-presence with an audience, which I'll be speaking about more. Also, I am showing mostly my solo work, which you can recognize with the presence of my own shadow silhouette, in this case, my hand. Um, my body of work also includes projects with my collaborative theater company, Clyde Control, as well as design work for hire. So I'm gonna show some of that here. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to show a bit of the collaborative work work outside of my solo work. The main difference between my solo practice and these works are working in collaboration, working with video in larger scales, um, in a more theatrical context with multiple screen surfaces becoming set pieces or interfaces, and working with and choreographing other bodies. 
um, and sometimes working with a live band as well. So in this case, I'm using like scrim and projection as sort of like an immersive projection space. I also want to clarify here that by the nature of both curation and the space requirements of my shows, roughly 75% of my works are programmed in a performing arts and theater presenter context, 10% in the film and animation context, 10% in an arts and new media festival type context, and 5% other, such as science museums. This is mainly because the work requires 6.5 meters of stage depth, which is not always available. For example, cinema spaces don't have this depth. Um, and the screen that I perform with is three meters wide and I think 2.3 meters tall. So it's, it's fairly small, but um, because I required that, that stage depth for the front projection screen and rear projection of 6.5 meters, um, I could perform in a room like this, but um, there's also sight line issues often. Um, and the work is best seen on a proscenium stage or black box theater for sight light reasons, as I mentioned. Um, even though I have also performed in plenty of non-traditional spaces, such as a large hall in a natural history museum or an art museum or a planetarium. Another reason for the breakdown is that my work is more sustained in a theater presenter context. I am able to support myself with performance fees, whereas some of the other art spaces don't have access to the space in their budget or the structure for supporting the labor of the presentations. It has been fascinating that the audiences and language of the conversation about the work shifts based on the audience and context in which my work is being seen. Shadow has been a rich medium for me to play with, and I'm still making discoveries in how perception plays a part in my work. Shadow is common, familiar, and quotidian, yet mysterious, otherworldly, and just as alive as the body and light that creates the shadow. Shadow is dimensional, yet flat, and has infinite fidelity in terms of pixels and frame rate because shadow is of course, physical. Shadow is both specific, uh, specific, only I can make my very specific shadow shape, yet anonymizing as it reduces most of my visual details. Shadow can make me larger than life. Shadow can be emotionally evocative and expressive. Shadow can become a vessel for the viewer to be drawn into the storytelling. By combining my onstage shadow with pre-made animation, I can play with the language of cinema and theater as a live shadow. Oh, okay, sorry. As a live shadow, how do I perform pans, zooms, camera angle shifts, et cetera? Shadow also lets me transform and transcend my body. As a shadow, my body becomes an abstraction, which then can represent something that is larger than life. As a shadow, my body can represent an individual, all of humanity, or the earth itself, or the biosphere. My body can become the creator and the one who is created, the destroyer and the one who is destroyed, all at the turn on the dime. This ping-ponging of identities was one of the investigations of Infinitely Yours, the video you see currently. For example, in this moment in Infinitely Yours, um, we see a very familiar individual experience of screaming alone in a car while stuck in traffic. But with the pan of the image, the shadow silhouette becomes larger than life, shoving her hand into the ground to dig out oil. These two images represent both the literal individual experience, the familiar one, and the symbolic society's experience of gas guzzling. As a performer, I place a lot of care and intentionality into the emotions my face and body convey at any moment in the storytelling. Curiosity, tenderness, joy, fear, and despair. As humans, we can't help but be cued into people's facial and body expressions in a way that I don't believe um, we do when we're looking at a body on screen, which we are right now. Um, it's fascinating to me as the artist that the audience intuitively interprets the emotions, despite that the visual real estate of my face is quite small on the screen. As an artist, I am fascinated to play with drawing the audience in emotionally while making a connection to metaphorical experience of symbolic characters. The audience interprets who or what the shadow figure represents at any given moment, 
When definitely yours, I was interested in taking moments from news articles about the climate crisis and performing them as first-hand experiences happening upon a body. This image, uh, these images include wildfires, flooding, extraction of resources, pollution, and human conflict. The shadow figure cowers, flees, and drowns, but also protects, discovers, and feels joy and hope. Sometimes as recognizable imagery and sometimes as more metaphorical imagery that somehow feel just as or even more familiar as if a muscle memory from a dream. I have been using the words illusion and perception a lot in my work. Crafting an experience of illusion and transformation and perception is ultimately about building for audience perception. Um, some of what I want to discuss today are my own artistic investigations based on observations made by audiences. Oops. One of the most common observations that I've had from my audience is about their mind trying to reconcile the dual narratives of the construction and illusion. Construction being the theatrical object side of things as they are visible on stage. Um, the screen, projector, uh, project, projectors, and the performer's body. The audience can see the layout of the trick. So um, in this piece, this will made itself, it starts with me in front of the screen, um, sort of like laying out the relationship that I'm gonna have with the screen for the, the rest of the piece, but from behind. However, the as the show pro uh, progresses, the interactions between the shadow and the imagery become more visually complex. Audiences have told me that throughout the performance, they can feel their brains battling between trying to figure out what is happening technically and just letting the imagery wash over them. I feel that these viewers are experiencing a dis dissonance and in interchangeably suspending disbelief and suspending belief. Another comment that I often hear is how the audience felt I performed the, art, uh, I performed the work flawlessly. As the performer, I know that no matter how much I choreograph my movements to the video, I am a millisecond off, an inch or many pixels off, or very rarely but sometimes even miss my cue. I believe that what is not a perfect illusion is completed by the audience's imagination. Suspension of disbelief is a cognitive investment made by the audience. They are doing part of the work for me to complete the illusions. The audience meets me halfway. In liveness on stage, intermedial challenges in contemporary British theater and performance, writer Claudia Georgie states that the five aspects that are often associated with live performances and are frequently deemed to be defining character characteristics of liveness are one, the co-presence of performers and spectators. Two, the ephemerality of the live event. Three, the unpredictability or the risk of imperfection, so the, the possibility of mistakes. Oh, four, the possibility of interaction, so this interaction between audience and the performer. And five, a specific quality of the representation of reality. The success of illusions um, is based on invitation and care. Oops, sorry. In other words, it has to happen in a shared, intimate space of presence. The invitation to be co-present encouraged the audience to be open to the possibility of phantasmagoria, something ephemeral and at the risk of mistakes or imperfection. The audience consciously or unconsciously collaborate with the artists by filling in what they see with their imagination and turn down the skeptical side of their brains. Again, I'm thinking about that cognitive investment that the audience makes when they see a live performance. I could easily have made my work as a short film with no live component, with a silhouette figure shot on a green screen and composited perfectly to every pixel and every frame. However, that would have reduced the experience and the impact of the work and would have missed the point of what I'm trying to achieve. I am much rather interested in a shared space to engage with audience perception in real time with some amount of risk. 
In my work, I often play with sleight of hand between what is real and what is not real. I believe that magic is an interactive two-way process and needs a live, intimate, real-life shared space in the audience who shows up with generosity to take a leap of faith to help complete the illusion. Magic exists in physical space, a perceived transformation of something that is tangible and real to the senses. And magic exists somewhere between the artist's intention and audience perception. And again, that's why I consider the live body and the live event to be important. I often weave elements of my own life into my work. It works well that these days most of us carry an amazing camera and hard drive in our pockets at all times. Featured within my, my work are items from my, around my home, videos and photos of natural or man-made features I shot while on a hike or a trip, animals, my plants, my local river and ocean, and so much more. Some videos I shot specifically for the piece, some are videos I shot years ago that integrated into the work. The oil fields that you saw at the top is when I came across on a road trip in Central California. All the trash in the ocean scene um, are my own plastic trash that I shot in spinning loops. And all this was sort of in context to me struggling with my own impact of the amount of plastic waste that I produce. So the work feels personal to me and I believe for the audience as well. The fact that I create and perform in the work myself adds to the narrative and impact of the work. I present my work as an offering and I approach creating with the playfulness of a tinkerer. My shows are modest in scale, um, clearly not commercial or made by a large team and quite idiosyncratic. To this end, I think about when an artist presents something they've made, they're asked, how long did it take you to make this? Which is always one of the questions I get during the Q&A after my shows. And when you see something made commercially, the question asks is, how much did it cost to make this? Oops. Um, these two questions implicitly place value in the labor and life dedication to artists, as well as speak to the research and practice it takes to arrive to a virtuosity in a very niche form, which is what it means to be an artist or practitioner of a craft. I know I'm simplifying a lot as there is a spectrum between what is artist made and commercially made, as well as that many artists can work on a commercially made projects. Perhaps this is a way of telling myself that even while there are big budget, high tech, mega spectacles out in the world, there is more than enough value in the individual or small ensemble of artists making something imbued with idiosyncratic magic for their community and audiences. For Infinitely Yours, I collected and cataloged news articles around environmental catastrophe for many years to note take the images and moments of climate crisis I wanted to illustrate and turn into first-hand experiences through performance in the work. It's fascinating to me how many of the images feel pertinent every time I show the work. Wildfires, flooding, drought, oil spills, and other env environmental pollution and more. Wildfires is especially pertinent to me having lived in Los Angeles for 17 years before moving to Canada um, where we are also suffering from unprecedented, uh, unprecedented fires in recent years. We are all struggling through our choices, small and big, through our contemporary world. I intended for my work to emotionally and viscerally impact the audience. Physical presence and creating a space for a collective experience is key. Within the work, I embody various symbolic and metaphorical experiences. Because I perform inside the dreamlike worlds as first-hand events happening upon my own body, I want the narrative experience to get under the skin of the audience, like exercising something we all feel collectively. In order to at least um, to start a conversation, if not to feel like a muscle memory from a shared dream. And um, just the last slide was just my website and also my theater company's website. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we have a little bit of time for a Q&A now. Great. Um, I would like to start by asking, how do you plan out your choreography? Do you storyboard a lot? And how do you test out things like uh, the shape of your body and reacting with the animation? It would be great to have some more insight in that. Great, thank you for that question. Um, how do I choreograph? So uh, it's a very integrated process between creating animation and testing things out with my body and choreographing. Um, one thing that 
was kind of, um, I took for granted and now I've lost is that when I was living and working in Los Angeles, I had a large apartment that I could set up my screen and projectors and test out things right away. Um, so I could do a little bit of animation, or even make a still image and go and project it and figure out what I want to do with my body. Um, and it was like, you know, you just go from one room to the other to test out the ideas. Um, and now that I've, used to Van I've moved to Vancouver, I don't have that anymore and how kind of limiting that is to not have that immediacy. Um, but yeah, so the choreography comes from just, th there is some storyboarding and conceptualizing of imagining what a composition looks like. Um, uh, but really it just starts from even making a still test image and then putting my body into it, taking photos and videos, using that as reference to keep expanding the animation and constantly testing. So by the time I've completed the animation, um, I don't really have to practice or rehearse because I've been you know, exper uh, using my body for the full time of um, creating the animation. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask about world building. Um, how do you construct your worlds? You mentioned that you come from a background of collage and you also collect a lot. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned sometimes you take a video from some years ago, so do you have a big archive of a visual um, yeah, video and photos? Yeah, um, yeah, for Infinitely Yours, the piece that I mainly show uh, presented here, um, the, the world building started with me just um, just kind of being stressed out about the climate crisis and collecting a lot of news articles and imagery from news items. Um, I was use, I'm using a, an app called Evernote just as a repository so I can kind of like remember these are the kinds of images and scenes that I wanted to imbue into this piece. So I did that for several years um, until I had the time and space and um, funding to just sit down and animate. Um, uh, and once I started doing that, yes, I come from a background in collage, and um, a lot of the, the footage that you saw, I, I shot. There's a few things that were found images that I kind of deconstructed and built into new things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like especially Infinitely Yours, there's so much of my everyday life imbued in, into it from my dining room and, um, you know, uh, friends, babies, <laughs> and um, yeah, so I definitely have sort of like a, a library of things, but there's a lot of things that I went and shot too, like ocean waves and the local river for textures. Um, so I'm definitely a collector of uh, video and photo. Yeah, okay, that's so interesting. So I, I would like to open it up also for the audience. If you would like to ask a question, now is the time. Just raise your hand. We have a question in the front. Could we get a mic? Hi, thank you for your beautiful work. Um, we were just watching it down in deep space and infinitely yours is so complex, the way we, you were just talking down about choreography and the integration with the animation. And you're changing scale. You're obviously getting closer to the screen and further away from the screen and lying on the floor sometimes <laughs> and standing up. Did you film it in one take? Because um, obviously we miss, we miss that because we're seeing the documentation, yes. so we don't get the wow factor of yeah. knowing that from a performance. Um, I would normally document it in one take, but for the documentation downstairs, I was pregnant, so I did allow myself like a little bit of editing between scenes, <laughs> just so I didn't have to jump up really fast. Um, but yeah, normally if I perform as a live performance, it's all just choreographed through with getting, lying down, getting back up, falling over. Um, so it is just a, a flow of um, movement and images. Yes. Another question in the front. So as far as I understood, you have a rear projection and you are in between, you as a shadow performer are mm -hmm. in between the rear projection and the screen. But how do you create this sort of layering, you know, you have elements in front of you. Is some parts of it pre-produced or do you have some sort of masking techniques or do you have a projector that is projecting from the front, a very strong projector or something like that? Yes, yeah, there's a projector behind which I, from which, with which I create the shadow and there's a projector from the front. And it's just a very precise jigsaw puzzle of imagery to make to get the illusion of things in the foreground and background. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask a question? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing yeah, your work. 
Um, I will skip all the technical questions, but and I'm interested about what happened before you decide using your own, you know, body, uh, considering then to create the choreograph, uh, choreography. So, uh, you know, like considering that you come from the background of not performance. Um, and I, I see it as an act also as um, resistant and empowered in the way. But I'm curious, like how how was the process for you to the before the decision you want to use your you know body, a body have this you know uh, authority as mm -hmm. well to assert authority in the way. But in the in the other sense, like as as a woman, and you know sometimes you also have the like, insecurity. I, I speak for myself. Um, yeah, and I'm curious how, how was the process for you? It was a sure, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, so I started making work for my own body while I was still at grad school at CalArts. And um, when I started, so it's a three year MFA program. When I started in experimental animation, I thought I would just make a bunch of short films and work in the animation industry. Um, but through being there and starting to collaborate with people from theater and puppetry and dance and music, um, so that's where the collaboration, like some of the footage that I shot, uh, showed, Cloud I Control, um, that's where our collaboration started. So that really influenced um, me to imagine work that's beyond just animation inside of a screen or, you know, a, like a cinema screen. Um, and also, when I was just making short films, I was still kind of integrating myself into it through like, you know, rotoscoping my hand and then turning, make, making that turn into a machine or something like that. So there was always something gesture and performative that I was considering while making just, just straight short films. So it kind of made sense for me to kind of like, how do I add complexity by making it a live body part or, or a full figure? Um, so in some ways it kind of felt natural, but I think being in that kind of very open experimental setting and kind of being exposed to theater and puppetry um, and working with people of that background, I think also gave me confidence to be like, yeah, this is a path that I want to go into. And as I said, you know, as an animator, I, I have shown some stuff at, of course, like film festivals, animation festivals, but I'm kind of more in this performing arts theater festival type world now. Thank you. One more question, and then we will move on. Can you talk about the music in Infinitely Yours? Because oh, sure. it's, the music is amazing and it really carries the piece. I'm curious, is it composed for the performance and how do you go about doing that? Is it composed beforehand mm -hmm. and then you choreograph to it, yeah. et cetera? Um, great question, thank you. Um, for Infinitely Yours, the music was all pre-made. Um, it's all music by my friend Morgan Sorn. Um, so going to you know, grad school and being based in LA, I was very lucky to have a lot of musician friends and I could just be like, hey, I like your music. Can I look at your um, archive and find music and use them and like license them? Um, so yeah, and then what's cool is that because it's all by Morgan, for some of the performance, I was able to tour with him performing live um, with some of the, like some of the, like half the tracks missing. So you could do drums and vocals on top of like a, a stripped down version of the music. So that was really fun to do that at like Sundance, for example. Um, for some of the previous solo pieces, it, I did commission my friends to make music. Um, so it was original music for the piece. But as an animator, it really helps to have that backbone of the soundtrack to start building on and using that as sort of like the emotional, building the emotional landscape. So I do prefer if I could just have that, even though I know it's really special to have you know, custom music for work. So I've, I've done both. Music was pre, was already existed. For Infinitely Yours, yes, yeah. yeah. Morgan already had the music. That's really interesting because it, it, it fits so well. I thought it, was, it must have been made oh, for yeah. the performance. <laughs> well, it, it really gave me a, a great jumping off point to use the music, yeah. Great. Thank you so much yeah, thank for you these so much, insights. Everyone. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I would like to now continue uh, with our next speaker and a quick introduction. Akiko Nakayama is a painter who depicts the beauty of conveying energy metamorphosis through several media such as installation, video and performance. She brings paintings to life by combining movement, colors, shapes and textures using different types of liquid. Her work can be described as a form of improvisational poetry. 
There will be a presentation tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Deep Space, where she comments alongside video clips and goes in depth about her work, uh, which she coined with the term a live painting. So don't miss it. Welcome, Akiko Nakayama. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me. Thank you for your time, everyone. Such a beautiful day, and um, much appreciate to be here. And uh, I am Akiko Nakayama, based in Tokyo, Japan, and also Kochi Prefecture, the island part of Japan. And then I am, uh, yeah, this is mini performance in my studio. I'm using video camera with the macro lens. And then, it is like a duo performance with natural phenomena with a painter. I also doing a solo performance and duo session, bridging uh, and the installation work with musicians. Yeah, it is my, uh, not my studio, it is on the stage. And then my canvas is, yeah, it is the macro lens and lighting. And this is the stage. So my painting uh, should be like a, a deep source of the potatoes, <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't see all of the particles uh, on the projection. So during the live performance, I couldn't expect uh, how it goes on. And making the rivers and yeah. It is kind of my miracle. My lighting is uh, super hot. So uh, the air evaporated well uh, underneath of the uh, plastic one, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I can draw a line, but uh, it is completely collaborating with uh, physics. Yeah, a live painting, it is a live performance of dynamic changing scenery by paint. I depict beauty of convey of energy metamorphosis. And then sometimes I collage with my photos and uh, making and it combined the metaphors with metaphors and words and words real time spontaneously. And also, uh, yeah. I ran fine arts at, at university in Tokyo. I was spending my days doing light painting sessions and with musicians in jazz club and going to museum galleries and so on. And painting is the basis of my studies, the fine arts. I became interested in paintings that involve time, like the way water and colors change in front, and also how DJ uh, make a time stretch on the stage like that, and musicians and watching animations uh, connect time with time. So it became the most exciting thing. Yeah, it is installation work. After graduating, I mainly performed in Tokyo and went on artist residencies and toured several countries. Today is 
today I share my experience with phenomena. And stop. Uh, oh. mm, back to the, my studies. Uh, here are three works that left an um, impression on me. Uh, it is portrait of Prince Hyun-myung in Korea. Uh, I was very impressed with it. Half of the painting was uh, completely destroyed, the blank area. It, uh, it is because of the fire, and we do, do not know the beauty of the completed painting. However, I felt something wonderful combination with this blank space. The passing shape of the fire here and the shape that the painter drew precisely. So I feel it is good contrast. Of course, it was a tragedy and a big loss, but the expression on the prince's face has become limitless in our imagination. Then like Benir, uh, no, then like Venus de Miro and Cezanne's unfinished works, I become obsessed with uh, work that com combine the unknown or phenomena with a painter. It's like a dual work. And also I share that kind of work. Uh, when I do Beijing, uh, mm, mm, so this is the sculpture work in the uh, uh, in front of the gate of the temple, and uh, the man uh, looks like really it seems like my grandfather's face, and then but it is uh, Saint, the guardian. Why I recognize it is the guardian and saint. Uh, I think one of the answer is this. The cross is uh, floating because of the aura or something uh, powerful uh, existence, uh, the cross float. So, uh, Mm, I'm interested in uh, the a shape that makes us feel invisible energy. And then I start again my work with musicians. Skip, skip, skip. Oh, yes. This is my work again. Uh, this is my canvas. So the invisible shape uh, depicted by me is jumping the humor. So sometimes the visuals uh, shows the, the invisible feeling on the stage. Like to be a uh, that singers uh, melody or soft soft voice and some deep um, concentration grooves with orchestra to be a uh, storms or hurricane from the uh, saxophone and some ghost face from the dancers to be a uh, heating breath, to dancing with the uh, groups. And it is also uh, the dancers 
from the audience lights. And be to be a shape of the inside the body of the dancers. Shimmering like uh, stars, fires, space, to the moon, to be a spotlight. Yeah, my paints become a uh, Uh, it is paint, but uh, it is not only a paint. Uh, it become our uh, same feeling with uh, your water is sharing uh, materials for all of the animals and humans as well. And color is the to be a language. So in the stage. I use the invisible uh, phenomena with some uh, colors as metaphors. So I often use bubble during the performance. I really like the uh, zoom on the tiny bubble because it become a um, well, bubble to be a good metaphor of the ephemeral thing. But the shape, the f for the physics, the round shape is super strong, so it have a con. Uh, a good contrast existence for me. Like this. And going back to the video. What I think about through all my work is how do emotions spread in our hearts when the tears spring or the heart is hot? Sometimes I find the sensation of something touching my heart while light painting. This song is not from my video, <laughs> but nice. <laughs> yeah, accompanying by a gentle feeling. It's like experiencing the joy of seeing colors with my eyes, like noticing the vividness of leads and blues for the first time. There are moments when I'm so happy that joy bubbles up from the source of my heart, feet. And while traveling, like today, uh, yeah, my work is combination with well, local phenom lo local uh, con uh, characteristic of the fa uh, water, like the surface tension and humidity. So uh, it is a suminagashi. Uh, the ink marbling technique. 
even only the water and sumi ink, uh, the shape is unlimited. So I often do a workshop uh, during traveling with kids, like this. And then pigments, the con each cities, each countries have uh, different types of the grounds. So the history and culture of the pigments is totally different. So I often go to the riverside and seaside and picking up the local colors like this. And it's really like a pigment. And going back to the, my studio, I also picking up the pigments and sometimes combine the local materials with pigments. Yes. So I'm traveling and uh, maybe tomorrow's performance, uh, I can uh, encounter with new paint. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, now we have a little bit of time for questions. Yes. I would like to um, start with a question about sound. Mm -hmm and music, because uh, we haven't uh, heard any sound now, but uh, many, many of your uh, performances are uh, with sound or musicians. Um, how, do you, how do they influence your painting in your work? Mm. Mm. So then, when I collaborated with the techno musician, and uh, five, it was five hours DJ in Beijing uh, live performance. And then uh, I completely saw the st strong construction with the beats of the techno. So, so I thought uh, there is, there are already have a strong constructions. So, uh, Mm, it is not necessary to do this. So it is uh, collaboration, uh, excitement, I think. So like a, it's like a espresso with cake or coffee with chocolate. It's, it is the <laughs> collaboration. The, it's uh, both influenced. Okay. Um, I also would like to ask about um, your work has been described as improvisational poetry. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate on how poetry maybe plays a part in your work? Mm. It is a very difficult question. But during the presentation, I spontaneously chose the word uh, even in Japanese, I couldn't speak well, <laughs> but uh, sometimes the pictures, visuals, and uh, the environment naturally speaks, and I just listen and having a conversation with that, and then it makes a word or sentence a poet. Mm. So sometimes it becomes a beautiful poet, but sometimes it's just a uh, uh, noise. But uh, I like both. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this. Um, it looks like you're using multiple screens. Mm -hmm. And do you have multiple cameras, so you're doing multiple paintings? Yeah, sometimes I use three cameras, three projectors. Mm. It becomes a panorama. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Another question? In the front? Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your beautiful work with us. Um, I have a question about like when you have a show, how much is chance and how much is like composed or planned? How how how, how much? much is by chance? You just put something on and something happens and like or in, in, well as opposed to how much is planned or choreographed or composed. Oh, it, you mean the perf the times of performance? But yes, like when, when there is a show for a band, or like how much you've like rehearsed and planned, ah. this is going to happen here, it's going to have this kind of effect, or how much is ah, kind of a chance or something that surprises you? Mm. Mm. Yeah, there are some times the theater concerts, of course, I, we have a rehearsal, but... Uh, mm. Mm. <laughs> Only, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, if I can perform in the, uh, the space, uh, space theater of the NASA, uh, it is really a stable condition uh, of, for the making phenomena. But in the earth, it is luckily uh, really much effect on my painting, the noises and unexpected uh, things. Because, you know, my canvas is such messy. So uh, if I mistakenly touch this point, and then it spread it out. Uh, the thing suddenly changed the white. But uh, mm, that kind of thing I rehearse. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and also this is like a soccer gym, uh, baseball gym, mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I can uh, pick up from my studio the inks. Uh, this is the area of the scene one, red, blue, green area, and white, black. And then I know so well about the condition of the what surface tension is, how strong or uh, the concert hall is cold, so uh, the surface is a bit stronger than yesterday or something like that. So I can predict uh, how ink spread. But uh, after that, it is adventure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, I also had another question, which is I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about the materials that you use. I mean, um, I'm not sure if it's watercolor paper. Also, I see inks. Mm -hmm. um, water, maybe there's like even gels at some point, mm -hmm. or what makes the bubbles that you featured. Um, so I'm just curious about some of the materials. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, normally I, I use ink and watercolor and deratching because uh, in history, pigment and is made by uh, the minerals. And also, it combines with glue. So glue is also invisible, but most in, uh, important uh, member of the painting. So sometimes I use only glue. It's invisible, but uh, it's really good effect on the how bubbles uh, appears from. And also the size of the, the injector is also important because uh, how much air inside is decided mm. of the size of the bubble. Yes, and also I, um, this is, this is the most 
important thing during performance. Uh, it is like a straw, uh, and I can touch the surface of the bubble uh, with my breathing. So I can control how touch and making a vortex of the inside the chale, petri dish. Yeah, we are really does it looking. Make sense? Yes, it yes. does, and it's really mesmerizing. And we are looking forward to. Uh, ah, we have another question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your wonderful work. It was mesmerizing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about um, what what direction you or how you see your practice developing in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, you talked about the collaboration between uh, your paintings and sound. Mm -hmm. If you ever thought of maybe linking tra transducers underneath your canvas, which mm -hmm. move in time with the musician you're performing with, mm -hmm. or if you... Um, uh, think of thing how do you how you develop different technologies since mm -hmm. I can see you've developed quite a few technologies. So what what's coming mm -hmm. next? Or? Thank you for the questions. So mm -hmm. for the um, practicing uh, always. Uh, sar uh, Many waters and with uh, mm, the beautiful time uh, about the physics does surrounding us. So uh, mm, firstly. Mm, Mm. I need to be my sensor is much sensitive. Like, uh, mm. for example, today I went to breakfast in the hotel, and then uh, the apricot jam machine is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, it sounds nice and uh, really interesting. Uh, did in uh, that kind of uh, ma machine and technology and sounds and shape and taste and feeling. It's like a tiny concert hall for me. And then uh, like um, uh, when I make a soup, uh, the Every ingredient is like a pigment, so it is my daily practice. And also, uh, collaborating, future collaboration with technology. Uh, I sometimes use a tiny speakers and amplify system underneath of the paint. And uh, for example, the saxophone players a signal comes for the uh, camera A and camera B as a drum. Uh, but um, um, but the sound already exists. So I want to uh, make a blank area because the precise uh, shape is already existence from the musicians. So, uh, with technologies, ah, I remembered. Uh, when I started the solo performance, uh, I used the programming system I called Fruit to Wave. Uh, it is like a MIDI system. My video cameras. Uh, color signal separated 64 MIDI signals, and it's going to the Ableton Live on my laptop, and then I assigned my uh, sound track, 
and also it controlled by painting. Uh, mm, but at that moment, that chaos is predictable chaos. So mm, I want to go more roughly way. So <laughs> yeah, at that moment, I stopped that kind of process. But uh, right now, uh, I got the inspiration from you. So maybe I start that. <laughs> Thank you both for your questions and for your answers. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to move on, but give a big round of applause for Akiko Nakayama. Thank you very much. Arigato. Now I would like to introduce our third and last speaker of the Art Disposition panel, which is Helen Starr. Helen Starr is an Afro-Caribbean curator, producer, and cultural activist from Trinidad and Tobago, currently based in the UK. She founded the Mechatronic Library in 2010 to give marginalized artists access to technologies such as game engines, virtual re reality, and augmented reality. She has worked with many public institutions and is interested in how digital art forms transform our understanding of reality by world-building narratives through storytelling and counter-storytelling. Now let's welcome Helen Starr. Uh, apologies, my laptop's just run out of charge. Sorry, I have to reboot. So sorry, everyone. Waiting it for it to load, I can describe myself. So I am uh, Afro-Carib, uh, which is a particular ethnicity of the 
Caribbean islands, uh, similar to the Garifuna people. Um, my mother is indigenous, so I try and speak and think from an indigenous perspective, mainly because um, I'm trying to archive what little is left from uh, this very unknown but very rich culture. So I uh, don't consider myself to be an artist. I consider myself lucky enough to support artists by curating and co commissioning works. And through the commissioning of these works, we are able to reach a point where uh, I can articulate ideas which are very difficult to communicate. Um, uh, in the language of uh, the old world, let's just say. Um, the, the projects that I work on tend to be very long projects, so they um, often take uh, three or four years to bring to fruition, to fruition, and in that time, the artists who I work with and I tend to become... Uh, more than friends, and we share uh, writings with each other, we talk about how we think, and so uh, in many ways our works become entangled and entwined, me trying to articulate their works from my perspective, and they also trying to communicate with me in a non-verbal way, um, about their ideas. I work a lot with technology and in particular, um, in particular uh, the technology uh, of VR, AR, and uh, recently a project using machine learning, which is very exciting. Uh, VR for me and for quite a few indigenous people I notice seems to be a form that we prefer there's something happening at the moment which is called the indigenous renaissance and i think it's not i'm just part of a wider movement that seems to have suddenly emerged and um in trying to express what it is to think like uh, an indigenous person who is also of african descent um Sorry to say, but it's not loading the screen, the slideshow. It's taking a long while to download. Hmm. That's half an I think this is happening because I'm about to uh, bash artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> and the ghosts, the ghosts are coming out. Sure. 
uh, I should also say I tend to work with, uh, I would call them marginalized stories rather than artists from marginalized backgrounds. So I tend to be very interested in stories which uh, are not usually told. Um, I also um, am a disciple of the Jamaican philosopher Sylvia Winter, who I talk about in any opportunity um, that I have and um, whose work I spread and litter into pretty much all of my conversations. Uh, Sylvia Winter um, is a Jamaican philosopher who is in her 90s and uh, she is a post-colonial theorist and by post-colonial rather than decolonial um, Sylvia wants to find a way to create a world where, um, where everyone is safe and equal and not just uh, blended and becoming homogenous, but where uh, we're all able to practice our, practice our difference. She has a, an extensive body of work. She is a um, professor at uh, Stanford University and she writes from, um, her work is foundational in character. Ah, okay, we got it. So, th this is me and my bio. There's Trinidad on the right. We, we, we can see Venezuela from, uh, from my house. We can look over the bay and see Venezuela. So we are very much part of South America, but politically and historically, we are part of the Caribbean. Uh, Trinidad is unusual in that it was the last uh, island to be colonized. So this isn't the island where the indigenous people, the Carib people made their last um, stand. And we are an island where I think 85% of us uh, recognize and acknowledge that we have uh, indigenous ancestors. Uh, we also, uh, although we're a republic, we actually have an indigenous queen. We're the only tribe, I believe, who recognizes a historical indigenous queen. So if you can imagine being a republic with a queen, you can understand what a complicated society uh, we have full of many uh, ethnicities. We are 50%, uh, something like 50% Roman Catholic, 50% Hindu uh, in terms of our population. So we cross, we really exist as a transcultural space. Uh, I talk a little bit about uh, Carib people, and this is from uh, Christopher Columbus's log book in 1498. Uh, these people, as I have already said, are very graceful in form, tall and lithe in their movements, and wear their hair very long and smooth. They also bind their heads with handsome worked handkerchiefs, which from a distance look like silk or gauze. Others use the same material in a longer form, wound round them so as to cover them like trousers, and this is done by both men and women. It is the fashion amongst all classes to wear something at the breast and on the arms, and many wear pieces of gold hanging low on the bosom. thinking through material, such as the material, the exquisite material that was found on the islands and the looms which are never spoken about and thinking about looms as sophisticated pieces of technology. I think, think of the phrase, it's material, which is used to indicate that something is not relevant or important in a particular context or discussion. Essentially, it means that a particular detail or aspect doesn't matter and can be disregarded because it has no bearing on the situation at hand. It's often used to dismiss something as unimportant and inconsequential. 
The, the Jamaican philosopher Sylvia Winter is known for her vast corpus of work, which critically examines the Eurocentric framework that underlies the traditional conceptions of the current world-dominating philosophy of humanism. Winter's work is distinctive in many ways for its extraordinary range of literary, philosophical, and historical references, for example, but perhaps the most striking feature of her work is its foundational character, its relentless quest for the most interconnected and totalizing ground on which to secure the humanist ideal to which she aspires. Winter seeks to restore to our conceptualization of human life the framework of a direction, a telos, the systematic objectification and violence of colonialism gave the lie to Europe's humanism. As Fanon put it in the closing pages of his anti-colonial manifesto, when I search for man in the technique and style of Europe, I see only a succession of negations of man and an avalanche of murders. But what bears reflection is that neither Fanon nor Césaire want to abandon humanism on the contrary, they want to correct its vision and fulfill its promise. This is why, as Fanon goes on to announce, the aim of the post-colonial project is to try to create the whole man whom Europe has been incapable of bringing to triumphant birth. Humanism is a philosophical and ethical approach that emphasizes the value agency and potential of human beings. It places a strong emphasis on reason, rationality, and the potential for human beings to improve themselves and society through education, critical thinking, and ethical action. From the 20th century onwards, humanist movements are typically non-religious and aligned with secularism. Most frequently, humanism refers to a non- theistic view centered on human agency and a reliance on science and reason, rather than the revelation from a supernatural force to understand the world. And yet, this epistemological conceit now crumbles in the face of artificial intelligence and its godlike colonization of the global North's professional class. This is a quote from one of the artists who I work with, who talks about the slow process of painting and animation, allow time to dwell on difficult imagery, such as the imagery that I'm probably in, evoking in you with this difficult conversation around colon, colon, decoloniality. The slow process of painting and animating allow time to dwell on difficult imagery, to haunt and be haunted by these specters of feminist history as I draw them out of the shadows. While the primary act of painting allows for a playful transference between the visual and the tactile, the concrete and the imagined, it is digital animation that enables me to transform this material into a story world with a sense of duration, history, and future possibility. The concept of materiality is a central topic in philosophy and has been explored by various philosophers throughout history. Materiality generally references, refers to the idea of the physical existence of things in the world as opposed to their immaterial or abstract aspects. It's the quality of being composed of matter or substance or information. Questions about personal identity and the persistence of object over time often touch on the concept of materiality. Philosophers ask how an object or a person maintains its identity over time despite changes in its material components. The term autopoiesis refers to a system capable of producing and maintaining itself by creating its own parts. 
The term was introduced in the 1972 publication, Autopoiesis and Cognition, The Realization of the Living, by Chilean biologist uh, Humberto Mutarana and Francisco Varela to define the self-maintaining chemistry of living cells. Autopoietic systems are structurally coupled with their medium, embedded in a dynamic of changes that can be recalled as sensory motor coupling. This continuous dynamic is considered as a rudimentary form of knowledge or, condition, or cognition and can be observed throughout life forms or forms of informational beings. Allopoiesis is the process whereby a system produces something other than the system itself. One example of this is honey, a substance very different from the flowers and bees from which it is produced. This is a system which uses dance to communicate the informational whereabouts of different types and flavors of pollen. While this simultaneous manifest manifestation of both autopoetic and allopoetic aspects is most evident in humans, we can find similarities in other organisms and systems. Social, social insect colonies, for example, certain plant systems, some AI systems such as artificial life, and ecological systems, also such as rivers, also exhibit dual elements of self-sustaining autonomy and external interactions and modifications. Sylvia Winter took her epistemological shift from the work of cognition scientist Mutarana. What we see, feel, think, and know are all entangled in a somatosensory, social, and political framework. What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain was the title of Mutarana's seminal paper published in 1959. The frog does not seem to see or at any rate is not concerned with the detail of stationary parts of the world around him. He will starve to death surrounded by food if it is not moving. His choice of food is determined only by size and movement. He will leap to capture any object the size of an insect or worm, providing it is moving. The radical conclusion at the time was that the eye not only sees, but also processes images, even before they are transmitted to the brain for further processing. Mutarana was able to show that the eye neither simply takes pictures like a camera, nor does it send them to the brain without filtering. Instead, the eye itself extracts valuable information for, from what it sees. In turn, what we see and what is said may trigger in us changes of mood and vision. For Mataruna, a conversation is an inextricable linking of language, emotion, and body in which the nervous system is the medium in which all intersect. Language is seen as a domain of essentially arbitrary and consensual distinctions developed through a history of mutual coordination of action. It does not and cannot describe an independent and objective world. We construct the objects of our discourse in our discourse. This leads to a view of the social world as constituted by recurrent conversation interactions between structurally coupled organisms intertwining language, emotion, and the body in diverse but equally valid domains or indeed realities. Mataruna has constructed a comprehensive and, consist and consistent explanation of living and cognizing organisms from the basic processes of the cell to the complexities of language and self-consciousness. In doing so, he generates a radical view of cognition in which the world we experience is a subject-dependent creation, constrained only by our basic autopoiesis and our structural couplings. 
As humans, we are not confined to mere perception. Instead, our brains actively engage in the process of rendering and creating diverse realities. The, the human animal is both a self-sustaining being and a creator who can influence the external world. We have the magical ability to self-maintain, allowing our bodies to generate cells, repair tissues, and maintain internal stability despite changes in the external environment. But what is even more extraordinary is our capacity to transcend this autopoiesis and venture into the realm of creation. In this duality, we are capable of not only shaping our own existence, but also producing the tools to shape the external objects which impact on the world around us. We create art, we build infrastructures and develop technology. And these gateways are guarded by our institutions. Key to Sylvia's uh, philosophy is the idea that we ought to institute ourselves through storytelling. Our origin myths and cosmogenies, she explains, are the storytelling grounds of the institution of initiation by means of which we fictif fictively auto-institute or pseudo-speciate ourselves as hybridly human. Here, Winter highlights the dynamic interaction between our genetic and non-genetic codes, what she describes respectively as our first set of instructions and our second set of instructions. In order to think through how our subjective self, sense of self and our subjective sense of we is intimately connected to the interrelational activities before, between or across the physiological and the storytelling. The effects, oh, I didn't put who the quote was from. It's from Karl Marx. The effects of English rule in India were devastating, Karl Marx observed in 1853. Yet this dragging of individuals and people through blood and dirt, through misery and degradation, was also a historical necessity, for England has to fulfill a double mission in India, one destructive, the other regenerating. The annihilation of the old Asiatic society and the laying the material foundations of Western society in Asia. We have a similar quote from Winston Churchill. Both men seemingly on opposite sides of the political spectrum. This outlook was buttressed by the rise of social Darwinist and racist theories of societal development. Winston Churchill, for one, had long believed that the Aryan stock is bound to triumph. As Home Secretary in 1910, he proposed the mass sterilization and incarceration of degenerate Brightons in order to strengthen their race. In a similar vein, he told Copeland's Royal Commission on Palestine in 1937, I do not admit that a great wrong has been done to the red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong, wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. I do not admit it. The concept of performance as praxis can be understood as a perspective that considers performance not solely as a display or representation, but as an active and transformational practice. From within my own culture are storytellers such as Trinidadian novelist Earl Lovelace document this process in novels such as The Dragon Can't Dance. In this radical political novel, the protagonist Aldrich follows a yearly ritual of putting on his costume and entering a new mental state with a dragon mask. No, this ain't a joke. This is warriors going to battle. This is the guts of the people, their blood. Aldrich, through his 
performance becomes the dragon of Port of Spain for two full days as do many thousands of Trinidadians, hundreds of thousands of Trinidadians every year as part of our carnival. In this context, praxis refers to the integration of theory and action, where performance becomes a means of engaging, challenging, and reshaping social, cultural, and political realities. Thus, performance, whether in the arts, activism, or other domains, is not merely an aesthetic or superficial endeavor. It becomes a deliberate and purposeful act of enacting change, critiquing existing power structures, and promoting social and cultural transformation. Performance as praxis recognizes the potential of performances to disrupt question and reimagine established norms and systems. It emphasizes the embodied experiential and participatory aspects of performance, where both performance and audience actively engage in shaping and co-creating meaning. Furthermore, performance as practice often involves an intersectional and inclusive approach, acknowledging the diverse identities and experiences within societies. It encourages the exploration of marginalized voices, histories, and perspectives, aiming to challenge oppressive structures and amplify underrepresented narratives. Ultimately, performance as practice implies that performances have the potential to transcend entertainment and serve as catalysts for personal, social, and political transformation. It invites critical reflection, dialogue, and collective action, emphasizing the power of performance to provoke thought, inspire change, and contribute to the larger discourse on social justice and cultural progress. Now I get to talk about the artists. So Warm Worlds and Otherwise by Anna Bunting Branch and scored by Alia Hussein was a joint commission by Wising Art Center, FACT, and QUAD, led by the Mechatronic Library. Anna says, my work in painting, moving image, and writing explores feminist visions and revisions of history. Inspired by the desire for different kinds of languages, as between painting and digital animation, image and object, fact and fiction, my practice plays with the boundaries between forms, disciplines, and genres, remixing elements from a range of sources, including theory, literature, anecdote, and archival material, to generate a new imaginative and narrative resonances. In 2022, I completed a PhD titled Practice the Difference, reading Lu Luce Irigori with feminist science fiction, which considers feminist science fiction as a methodology to approach the speculative question of sexual difference raised by the philosopher Lucy Irigori. The strange performative quality of the VR headset became central to my vision for this body of work, with the Oculus Go sparking my imagination. This dull prosthesis was launched in 2018 with the vision of making VR a ubiquitous household accessory, yet by 2020 it had already been consigned to obsolescence. Virtual wills, as I always say, require sort of, oh, this was a conversation between me and uh, Dr. Ranpura, and Ash says, virtual worlds require, some, some require sort of three key factors. So one, they require some form of presence, like a virtual presence. Second, they require some form of agency, and third, they require a very particular kind of space, which is the near and far space rather than the horizontal space. In the staging of Warm Wills and Otherwise, 
then, audiences were invited to become world travelers, not in the reductive sense of intergalactic conquest and the colonization of alien territory, but as Argentinian philosopher Maria Lagones more generatively, generatively defines it in her classic work of intersectional feminist theory, playfulness, world traveling, and loving perception. In this essay, Laguna states that her thinking emerges from two failures of love, which haunt her sense of feminist practice. My failure to love my mother and white Anglo women's failure to love women across racial and cultural boundaries in the United States. Drawing on her personal experience as an Argentinian-born lesbian, Lagones identifies world traveling as a craft of survival and resistance that has been honed by women of color in the US, noting that much of our traveling is done unwillfully to hostile white Anglo wolves, whose subjects have a vested interest in obscuring and devaluing the complex skills involved in it. Something I think about a lot is how the brain repurposed our sense of physical distance to understand social closeness and behaviors. When we say, I feel close to you, we understand that we are not physically close to that person. When we say, I feel you make me feel cold or you are cold, but well, that's another way where we can talk about our emotional states, which have nothing to do with what we think of as the touch sensation. Somato sensation or body sense is a mixed sensory category. This is a sense that helps humans recognize objects, discriminate textures, generate sensory motor feedback, and exchange social cues. The haptic mode contributes to generating and modifying our emotions. We extensively use touch in social communication when we want to express gratitude, dominance, or support. Most studies in investigating effective haptics have explored how touch does not only communicate the stimulus that contributes to pleasant or unpleasantness of touch, touch can also communicate a range of emotions. In particular, it has been shown that a texture's visual softness and smoothness correlates with the pleasantness of touching it. Touch communication between mothers and infants, as well as the petting of animals, is related to reduced stress, and touching some inanimate objects and textures can also be associated with pleasant feelings, while touching others induces unpleasant ones. Lagones offers world traveling as a way of deepening, understanding, empathy, and the political commitment between women within and beyond feminist communities. She calls upon those women who feel at home in the dominant worlds to relinquish their privilege and make themselves vulnerable to those other worlds and ways of being together that they have perhaps yet failed to perceive. We are fully dependent on each other for the possibility of being understood, and without this understanding, we are not intelligible. We do not make sense. We are not solid, visible, integrated. We are lacking. So traveling to each other's worlds would enable us to be, to be through loving each other. I should have mentioned I'm a world building curator. World building, of course, allows us to travel to each other's worlds. One whose truth for will coincide with the imperial reality in which we find ourselves, the single integrated history we now live. You see, the problem that we confront, that of the scandalous inequalities between the rich and the poor countries, of global warming and the disastrous effects of climate change, of large-scale epidemics such as AIDS, and we can now add COVID, can be solved only if we can, for the first time, experience ourselves, not only as we do now as this or that genre of the human, but also just as human a new mo mode of experiencing ourselves in which every mode of being human, 
every form of life that has ever been enacted is part of us and we are part of them. Anna says that reading Naomi Mitchinson's Galaxy Hopping Memoirs of a Space Woman, Joanna Russ's time-traveling tale of bodies, and Aliette de Boddard's Immersion, a prof prophetic short story about techni technological imperialism and avatar addiction, which Lucia Rigori's philosophy of sexual difference in mind. I was inspired to subject notions of technology, embodiment, and environment to defamiliarization, using wearable tech to conjure the ghosts of fleshy bodies, alien knowledges, and future fossils. The staging of bodies moving through a space activated by a constellation of interactive objects, theatrical lighting, and spatialized sound ensures that no one is a passive witness to warm wills and other otherwise, all are entangled within the story as it unfolds. This is most clearly played out when a viewer takes a seat in Sister's Kitchen and puts on a headset to enter the virtual environment, an act which transforms them into an unwitting performer within other viewers' stories. This is me writing about my experience of traveling to Anna's work and Anna's world um, in the next scene of Meta, when we inhabit the body of the flying non-human, we view the world with an alien perspective, and our minds labor to cipher meaning out of the scene unfolding beneath our feet. When this scene begins, we begin to fly. This interpretation gap, this liminal struggle, is redolent in the lives of those who are othered. And yet, in the second chapter of Anna's animation, the qualia of flight as you navigate the aerial dimension is familiar. This dream memory stored in your tissue is what, in the end, grounds you to the experience of being the alien other. Thus, meta begins its metaphysical skepticism towards the grand narrative of Western culture by its reverence for the virtual at the expense of the real, or more correctly, a fundamental questioning of what the real constitutes. By presenting the painterly work within an embodied rather than a semantic experience, Anna demands we do our critical thinking as part of a corporeal performance, where language and logic take second place to a somatic bodily understanding. She thus sidesteps the paradox at the heart of postmodernism, postmodern critique, the impossibility of deconstructing modernism without the concepts and methods that modern reason provides and moves us towards a metamodernist speculation. The virtual environment of meta is brought to life with Anna's col colorful, fluid, painterly style. The animation opens with the soft primitivism of an unknown planet, populated with creatures at once familiar and strange. In the near distance, a woman, a scientist in her golden years, stands beneath a pink sky, painting with sure leisurely strokes. The viewer, now embodied as her companion, drifts towards her blue cloaked figure. Cocoon-like structures hang from towering reeds and small exotic creatures emerge and play in a pond where the rainbow water moves like molasses on a hot day. Alia's immersive soundscape augments this alien landscape with excited wonder. It is an Arcadian scene, its bucolics interrupted by the sudden appearance of a large red creature, neither wasp, beetle, or butterfly. Its baleful nature can be felt rather than heard in haunted threads hidden in the musical score. We now move on to the second, uh, second artist whose uh, work is in, incomplete. We are currently in commissioning mode. This is year four of our partnership. It's called Tarang by Kanari Saraiya, who is a wonderful uh, world building artist and curator from India. 
This is one of Canary's favorite quotes. A secular subject like history faces certain problems in handling practices in which God's spirits or the supernatural have agency in the world. Labor, the activity of producing, is seldom a completely secular activity in India. It often entails, through rituals big and small, the invocation of divine or superhuman presence. Secular histories are usually produced by ignoring the signs of these presences. Such histories represent a meeting of two systems of thought, one in which the world is ultimately, that is, in the final analysis, disenchanted, and the other in which humans are not the only meaningful agents. Canari, with her work, invites us into her worlds where supernatural beings exist and play, asking us to participate in her perspective of reality. And there we get to this idea that information, which we now know has a material aspect, this challenges traditional philosophical distinctions between the mental and the physical. Philosophers have explored the relationship between information and consciousness, leading to discussions about the nature of mind, cognition, and the potential for artificial intelligence. Showing you some of the beautiful detail and the paintings that go into uh, Canary's digital worlds. She hand paints a lot of the textures and scans them into her world to add texture and to add feels and emotions to her work. The creation of virtual worlds and simulations re relies on the materiality of information. These virtual environments are constructed through the ma manipulation of digital information, and they raise questions about the nature of reality, perception, and the distinction between the physical and the virtual. Information theory has contributed to our understanding of complexity and emergent phenomena in various fields, including biology, economics, and social sciences. The material aspects of information processing in complex systems has led to insights into patterns of behavior and organization. You can see. We can see here how the eye is translating. For some reason, these images, which are full of detail, somehow make sense because the eye can see the patterns embedded in the whole visual. In summary, recognizing the materiality of information has indeed had a profound impact on how we perceive and interact with the world. It has influenced not only technological advances, but also our philosophical understanding of reality, the mind, and the nature of existence. As our understanding of information and its material implications continues to evolve, it will likely lead to further insights and innovations across various disciplines. The third, the third artist um, whose works I've commissioned is the amazing uh, black trans artist, Danielle Braithwaite Shirley. This is one of my favorite commissions that um, I made with her. Danielle is an artist who is very concerned of the erasure of uh, trans people from history. So her practice is about archiving uh, black trans history within her works. All of her works are made with aspects from black trans culture, from using her hair to create uh, vines, grass, and ivy, to using different tones of black skin to create textures within her virtual worlds. This was an amazing piece, well, I thought it was amazing, um, that we worked on together, which was called The First Trans Thought. This was a, a tapestry, it was a huge work, 200 by 300 centimeters, and um, it was controlled by a dance mat, which you see on the left. So 
the trick to this game was to dance your way through it and to avoid the eyes as they look at you. Here, Danielle is recognizing that the eye can also impact, that the eye can hurt. Being looked at in a certain way conveys information that has the physical clout to actually harm certain types of people. Just to give you a sense of the scale of the, the tapestry, we were looking at here at breaking the screen as well, rethinking what a screen could be, also looking at weaving and thinking about binary methods of technology. This was some of my thinking at the time about skin, about the eyes, about sensory organs. When skin thinks, it blushes in shame and pleasure. It tells when our heart skips a beat of love. Thin skin erupts in goosebumps when we encounter something beyond the universe of our discourse, such as a tree or a Garifuna aria. This is skin thinking awe, the feeling of fear coated with reverence. It is an emotional response to, the per to perceptually vast stimuli. Our sense of self does not end at the skin, but forms a hazy bubble around us. That film playing in our mind's eye emerges from the skin of our inner self and warns us. A stranger breaching this magic causes distress, which we say is an invasion of personal space. Our skin outside and in performs its own form of thinking. It has its own idea about this self, this I, which is separate from but braided to the brain, that voice in your head which whispers, beware. So matter sensation or body sense is a mixed sensory category. This is a sense that helps humans recognize objects, discriminate textures, generate sensory motor feedback, and exchange social cues. Final slide, I leave you with Sylvia the amazing Sylvia Winter, who was also the most extraordinary dancer, um, who writes about dancing in the snow the first time she came to the UK, feeling snow for the first time, dancing with it, the pleasure and joy that she got from the memory despite coming down with pneumonia a few days afterwards. And we end, end with a quote, one whose truth for will coincide with the empirical re reality in which we now find ourselves, the single integrated history we now live. You see, the problems that we confront, that of the scandalous in inequalities between the rich and the poor countries, of global warming and the disastrous effects of climate change, of large-scale epidemics such as AIDS can be solved only if we can, for the first time, experience ourselves, not only as we do now, as this or that genre of human, but also as human. A new mode of experiencing ourselves in which every mode of being human, every form of life that has ever been, ever enacted, is a part of us and we a part of them. Thank you for your talk, um, and thank you for this last quote. Um, I would like to immediately open up uh, for questions from the audience, because we're running a bit late. Yes, there is one question here. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. So uh, for me and uh, my friends, um, I'm an artist. Uh, it started uh, about five years ago when I read uh, an academic article about uh, Marcel Duchamp, mm -hmm. uh, written by an uh, African academic. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not conceptual art. This is not where it started, because it started long, long before in Africa. And then I was, what? <laughs> Um, and, and I read it, and after that, one after another, uh, a difference came up, like, okay, um, uh, expressionism uh, in the 1910s, 1920s. Well, it was, of course, a primitive painting of the Western uh, male painters, 
No, it was like um, they, they, they saw the um, African masks and they, had, uh, they encountered African uh, culture and they were inspired by that. And then, of course, they started painting that way. Um, another thing, but I'm not sure about that, that's what I'm thinking about now, is like uh, the uprising of 68. Yeah, um, uh, colonized countries, uh, French countries in, uh, in Africa, they started um, their uprise. And I think it was that was inspired. Um, that was something that inspired the students in France in 68 to do the same. So um, uh, decolonizing is not only uh, very important for, for, uh, for, for, black, for the black people, so like for my friends, but it is also very important for us because all truth, and this is about um, um, Ars Electronica, who owns it, truths are now flipping, and uh, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question is to you, um, 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 is this what you feel? Is, is this ongoing now? I mean, there are military coups now in Africa and um, the, of the French-speaking parts. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the reasons I write from my mother's perspective is because from my father's side, which is African, there's a lot of theory out there about history. I mean, history has really um, been archived in the old world and in, in Africa. Uh, it's really been decimated in... Uh, for, for indigenous people. And one of the things that I think about a lot is these parallels. So, so I, I wouldn't say expressionism came from Africa. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is that often because of poesis, because we are human, we, we have parallels emerging, right? We, we have movements or we have technologies. I mean, the technology of weaving in the new world, which was so sophisticated, didn't come from the weavers in Africa, right? It, things, I think things emerge simultaneously. I think of it as these waves sort of going up and down in parallel. I think that... that um, this is why I put the, the quote from Karl Marx and Winston Churchill. I think we, we have to really dig deeply when we think of the systems that we're operating within because nothing seems to be working. Uh, one of the things that Sylvia noticed when, and she writes about this in, I think, 1968, was when... That global, the spike in global warming actually happened when all the colonies began to become independent. And what she's effectively saying is if, if, if everyone in India, if everyone in China, if everyone in the West Indies follows the Western path of humanism, which puts the human first, that we're all going to die. So, but, but the, the issue with, you know, the, the, the purpose of colonialism was to put this particular type of ontology as the epitome of what you must strive for uh, as a human being, right? And that was based on, like, ideas of materiality and, and physical objects which can be owned, what we're trying to say now, what I, I think Sylvia's trying to say, is we need to move to an immaterial turn where being able to perform a particular dance is worth, brings more, as much status as owning a BMW. Because unless we completely shift the, the direction that the world is going into. We are not going to survive climate change, but and the real trick is how to make that a pleasure. How for it not to be seen as a punishment to give up material goods. The fact of the matter is the people in the global north are always going to use more resources because that's the nature of the weather in the global north. And we, we can't get away from that, and we can't, and we don't want to point fingers. What, what we do want, what I, I would 
what, what I'm saying is that Global South people, we too have something of incredible value to offer. We still have the abilities and the belief systems to connect with the supernatural, whatever that may be. And that's why I talked about artificial intelligence, because I'm saying, well, in our ability to create, we've now created a supernatural being. So how about we rethink what AI is, for example, and we re-enchant ourselves and we begin to believe or we begin to value things that are immaterial rather than things that can only be, be dismantled in a, a mechanistic way. And, um, and I think that throughout everything I was saying, I was talking again and again about materiality, but also information and information, information having material and how wonderful it is that we can construct these virtual worlds and we can now visit each other, that we can... One of the extraordinary things about Anna's world is we, I, we read all the works with her but she considers it, conceives of it as a fan fiction, so she mixed images and stories from all the books and created her own narrative. But because I had read the same books as Anna, I recognized where she took parts of her story from, and, but I recognized it visually. So while I was reading those books, I was visually seeing what the writer was creating, that Anna was also seeing the same thing, but she had the ability to paint it. And that's how I knew that both Anna and I, when we read the same stories, we were constructing in our minds this dream of the story, which looked the same. And I talked to Anna about how extraordinary that was to build a bridge between the two of us who are so different, who come from different cultures, but we are able to visit each other's wills and how extraordinary it is that now I know if Anna's reading a book and I'm reading a book, that we're seeing the same thing in our mind's eye. And uh, for me, that almost it becomes a definition of what it is to be human. Working. Oh yeah, for for us as artists, uh, as the group of artists, it's like um, okay, if if we think of uh, postmodernism, like uh, abolishing uh, the great histories, uh, the the great narratives, it's like um, okay, we redirect. We have to redirect now. We bring them back, and but um, we we present them from another focus. Exactly. I'm I'm not a fan of. Yes. destroying or rewriting history. History is history, is history. but we can re-enchant it. Uh, we can understand it. We can understand, for example, that the entire colonial imperative was because, you know, Charles V was in debt. And, um, yeah, and so I, I think a lot about this. The, to your point about the African art, it was the Nigerian people um, who made these incredible Ife heads, and the Ife heads were perfectly um, figurative, uh, and they were the, exactly the size of a human head, but slightly smaller. Um, so the whole one of the the whole impetus for that knowledge came because as technology grew, we could carbon date those heads, and they were carbon dated to the eighth century. And when that technology proved that the Ife heads were carbon dated then people understood that Africans began at the figurative and were moving towards abstraction. But the same happened in Europe. So Europeans began with figuration and were also moving to abstraction. And I don't think that it's right to say one group of people copied the other. I think it's interesting to think of these stories as parallels that sort of emerge from our shared humanity. 
Uh, I'm less positive about it. <laughs> I think that the, the white are not so like um, <laughs> creative and intelligent, but uh, okay. <laughs> well, I will say that my um, my partner is white and my children are half white and I think they're incredible. Yeah, of course, that's true. But I, I think that, um, uh, you know, like, uh, that we don't own it. it. It was not coming from us and us, I mean, um, well, I white think, artists. But uh, I think it's good to, 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 to understand that uh, it could be different. It could be different, but I also think it's good to understand that, that, the, uh, that it was the 1% who did this. It was the uh, colonial times. It was not the average European who shipped people across the Atlantic. It was the 1% that did it. And in fact, the first slaves in the Caribbean were white people, which a lot of people, uh, and they were shackled and they were forced to work in the slave plantations. The problem is that they could escape swim to another island and blend in as being non-slaves. But um, this is what I think of today. I think it's the same group. This is what I think. I think it's, this, you know, it's the same group of people. All the problems we have, it's the same 1%. And let's also talk about the oppression that happens in black countries. You know, I'm Trinidadian, it's a black country. We're one of the top 10 most violent countries in the world. So a lot of what uh, Sylvia and a lot of what our great thinkers like Eric Williams and um, James Baldwin really talk about is removing race from the discussion because race can be a distraction. And, and what we really need to look at is the economic oppression and how power works and operates because as soon as you bring race into the conversation all these emotions kick in and then we can't think our way out of this problem that the entire world now has to figure out which is climate change so thank you so much if you allow me to stop you there yeah. um, for sure, if there are any more questions, people could approach you and discuss and exchange uh, opinions and talk about it. So now uh, this will be the conclusion of the Artist Position Panel. Thank you so much for your talk. <laughs>